to give this talk on uh, the aesthetics of constructing and deconstructing the maglev's magnets. A little bit about what is the maglev, you folks will know this, so I'll go through that quickly. But the main part of the talk is, is the maglev's magnets and um, what applied superconductivity, uh, what applied material science is, and the examples I'll give are um, magnet making, uh, superconductivity, and something called Bose-Einstein condensation, which will be the, the strangest expression that you'll hear in this talk. Uh, and I'll try to explain what that is. But the underlying themes are the limitations of materials, that materials uh, provide profound limits to what you can accomplish. And that was true back in the Stone Age, and it's true today. Uh, and that uh, there are constraints on design that arise because of those materials properties and materials limitations. And then how those constraints have led to the Florida Bitter Magnet, which I think is no exaggeration, has, has changed completely uh, the landscape for high magnetic field research such that uh, essentially all of the leading magnet labs are now <coughs> using the Florida Bitter uh, Magnet technology. Uh, and the leap and field uh, achievable was substantial. So remembering that I gave this talk to uh, folks outside the magnet lab, uh, but thinking that it might be interesting for you to see what I say about you, um, uh, what is the magnet lab at FSU? Uh, it's a laboratory that provides the largest, most powerful DC magnets in the world. We use 56 million watts, 7% the power of the city of Tallahassee. We've got four million gallons of cooling water. We make a magnetic field that's a million times the Earth's magnetic field. We have the best magnet engineers in the world that we keep here. Uh, every now and then we let them out for some sunshine. Um, and then we have the strongest magnetic resonance imaging in the world down here. Those are the two uh, magnets that are the easiest to explain. Uh, folks know about magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, and just the notion that you've got a magnet that it's a million times the Earth's field. What they don't always know is how big we are, 750 employees and affiliates across our three campuses. Uh, uh, I'm often quoting Henry Ford when people ask me how many people work here, uh, I usually say about half. Um, and then we have a, we have a large uh, uh, educational role uh, 75 graduate students doing research here, 170, sorry, 75 undergrads, 175 graduate students, 56 postdocs. So this is a very large uh, community and we are working very hard to have that community become more aware of the other members because this, for, if you're a grad student or a postdoc or an undergrad here, there's a networking opportunity that you're not going to get like this any time later in your career. And we really want the graduate student and postdoc uh, group to uh, succeed and become more and more active. 103 professors, 113 research faculty, 125 other technical staff. So it's a huge endeavor. Uh, one out of every four federal research dollars that comes to Florida State University comes through the Magnet Lab. So we're very important to the Magnet Lab. We have Three major MagLab research themes. Uh, you can characterize all the research that's done here uh, in three categories. Some research falls into several categories. One is materials, uh, the other is energy, and the third one is life. And these are rather broad categories uh, so that they can capture everything. Um, the materials is the largest part of the research effort, uh, and it's, it's uh, discovering new materials and the properties of new materials. Energy in, includes petroleum research and biofuels research, uh, research on batteries, uh, uh, fuel cells. Life includes magnetic resonance imaging, uh, the proteins that are on the surface of bacteria and viruses so that we can try to combat uh, their functionality and make it so they can't uh, function properly, uh, imaging, uh, tumors in creative ways uh, using MRI. All of that's the subject of other talks. I'm going to focus on the magnets that lead to this and then give uh, two examples in materials. So applied material science is uh, a major part of the magnet lab. It's also a part of human endeavor since the beginning of time. Uh, materials in the human hand, this is clay, 
uh, can become a technology. And uh, I bought, I, I, I brought with me some examples. This is a, a very old uh, piece of pottery that has virtually no decoration on it. Uh, but that invention, that realization that you can bake clay and make a container uh, completely changed uh, human beings' ability to move around uh, to either follow game or follow um, uh, whatever resource they needed to follow uh, once you have a storage container. And uh, somehow the human mind is such that uh, a plain jar isn't enough, you have to start decorating it. And so I brought these shards. All of these were found before uh, any sort of uh, uh, American Antiquities Act would have made it illegal to pick them up. Um, <laughs> Well, I, who's laughing out there? Um, uh, but uh, somehow the, the, human, the human brain comes up with the notion of baking clay to get the vessel, uh, and then comes up with uh, the need to turn that craft into an artistic object. And these days, of course, uh, you've got a completely new art form uh, that's come out uh, in pottery. This is uh, the famous black on black um, technique from the San Alfonso Pueblo, which is the Pueblo closest uh, to Los Alamos. In fact, you have to drive through it to get to Los Alamos. Uh, Martinez family uh, is the, the family that uh, rediscovered the technique for making this black on black, and that's a, a water dragon. Uh, and that is the pot that I, I brought here. Another example is sand, which is just silicon and oxygen. Uh, but sand, uh, in the hands of uh, human beings uh, can make glass, which can be used for uh, artistic uh, uh, expressions. This is a Dale Cahuli, um sculpture. It can also be integrated into architecture. This is the Hall of Mirrors of Versailles. Uh, this, these windows overlook the, the gardens and the fountains. Uh, the entire opposite wall uh, is a solid wall, and they decided to make it out of glass, or um, mirrors uh, so that you get the reflection of the garden. Uh, but that was not just beauty and architecture. That was a statement of technological prowess at the time that that was built, because no other European power had the ability to make plate glass of that size, to make mirrors of that quality. So in effect, that those mirrors were uh, a space program, or were uh, uh, a demonstration of uh, technological ability that, that nations like to make uh, when hosting delegations from rival nations. And of course, glass has had other minor impacts. Uh, if you make fiberglass, uh, we actually wrap it around uh, some of our magnets as a reinforcing material because fiberglass, made in certain ways, is among the strongest of materials. And then it's also uh, in other configuration, made this little thing called the internet possible, um, such that it costs less to string a data channel across an ocean than it does uh, to make the connection from your house to the pole uh, at your street. Uh, they can take so much data on these uh, fibers. So all of the internet, essentially, uh, is uh, light pulses on uh, glass, uh, which comes from beach sand. Um, Limitations of materials play a key role. So in the Stone Age, which started around 10,000 uh, BCE and ended up, uh, the date depends on what your GPS reading is. Um, if it's in the Americas, uh, it really wasn't all that long ago. Um, you had to have a rock that flakes uh, and makes a sharp edge. So in the Southwest, it's obsidian. Um, this is a, a raw piece of obsidian I found. A uh, flint uh, also, of course, is, is broadly used. And that can then be shaped in, into a spear point. Um, the problem is, whereas those were, flint and obsidian, were state-of-the-art uh, Neolithic materials, uh, they're both brittle. And so if you were a hunter uh, going out with your spear, you had to have a spare with you uh, uh, that was roughed out but didn't yet have a sharp edge. Because if your first spear point that was brittle broke, you needed to sit down and finish flaking out your spare uh, to put a sharp edge on your spare before you could continue hunting. 
And so as a result, every hunter had to also become a talented obsidian napper in order to be successful. So it actually, the materials limitations ended up uh, making it so that you could not specialize skill sets as much as you'd like to. There's no reason that your best hunter would also be the best person smashing two rocks together. In fact, I would think in the Venn diagram of skills, um, hunting requires the ability to run fast and be quiet for long periods of time, and banging rocks together probably favors people who talk a lot and make a lot of noise. Um, but um, I was out uh, hiking in New Mexico and came across these roughly 20 pieces of obsidian that were just lying in a circle. And so somebody hundreds of years ago had clearly broken their spear point and needed to sharpen up uh, their spear point in order to continue hunting. So that's an example from some time ago. The Iceman, uh, who you've heard about, uh, was found uh, a few years back in the Alps, uh, lived at the transition from the Neolithic Age to the Copper Age. His dagger uh, was made of a flint blade. Uh, he used ash. Uh, animal sinews, uh, the other materials that he took advantage of. His axe had a U uh, haft on it, he used birch tar, uh, he had leather straps, and then the blade was made of copper. So uh, he was right at the beginning of the Copper Age. Uh, the point on this slide is that all of these materials are still found materials. So everything we've talked about so far are materials that you just look for. Uh, you don't do any manipulation, you don't do invention other than in the techniques uh, to use the materials. The first human invention of the material begins with the Bronze Age, which uh, was around 3000 BCE to 1200 BCE. And bronze is a mixture of copper and tin. Uh, part of the reason that the Bronze Age didn't start until 3000 BCE is that you had to have long distance trade routes for geological reasons that I don't begin to understand, apparently uh, copper and tin are very rarely found in close proximity. So the tin mines in Cornwall, England, uh, uh, tin from those mines has been found as far away as Phoenicia uh, in the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, it was that valuable and that rare. And this is an example of a, a dagger. You can tell already that because of the materials properties, uh, you can end up putting a lot more craft and even some art into the dagger uh, that you cannot do with a, a stone tool. Uh, so this is a late Bronze Age. It comes from southern Georgia, uh, the country, not the state. Um, I'm not sure if the state would be able to make uh, something of that. Uh, anyway, we'll leave that. No, God. <laughs> is anyone here from Georgia? Um, uh, the Iron Age started at uh, 1200 BCE, went to 400 AD. Uh, the ability to um, uh, forge iron tools was a large part of the strength of the Hittite uh, um, empire uh, that gave such great difficulties to uh, Egypt. Uh, this is actually an Iron Age dagger from King Tut's tomb uh, that's too old. It's so about 120 years too old. The Egyptians really didn't have the technology. Then. The reason that that exists is that that actually was made from a meteor. Uh, so they couldn't make the iron, uh, but they could find it and then shape it. There's about 100 uh, archaeological finds of iron tools that were made from meteors. But it wasn't a, a human-controlled technology until about 1200 BC. And of course, iron is much stronger than bronze. Uh, so it's maybe a little depressing that uh, a lot of the technology I've talked about so far is, is of a military focus. Uh, but there is also human invention of materials for aesthetic reasons. Uh, around uh, 700 uh, BCE to 200 AD, um, the uh, ability to make synthetic purple and blue uh, in China uh, was a major accomplishment. So this uh, terracotta army uh, that was meant to protect the emperor in the afterlife uh, was brightly colored. In fact, even now when they excavate them, they still retain a lot of the color, but they lose it within the first week or two. So they've slowed down the excavation 
until they can figure out how to stabilize the colors. Uh, but all of these colors here are once again just found. The exceptions are the purple and blue. And they're called Han purple and Han blue uh, because they were um, a feature of the Han dynasty. And we have no idea uh, how they figured out how to make this material. And this is the reason why. Uh, it's the first synthetic purple pigment. It's made of a mix of, of barium and copper minerals, uh, neither of which have the right color, quartz, and some lead salt uh, that acts as a catalyst and a flux. So if you don't know what those are, uh, that's just a, a, an addition that makes the chemical reaction happen. Uh, so the idea is this is pretty complicated, and from none of these materials would you expect to be able to make purple. And then you need to heat to 900 to 1,000 C. And I guess, who here knows what that is in that? Brian, can you help me out here? Because <laughs> my understanding there would be no yeah. math. Um, so it's, it's, it's uh, let's say, something like 1,800 uh, Fahrenheit. And you've got to go up to that temperature and hold it uh, in order to get the color, to get the reaction to happen. Why they would do it, no idea. How they did it, no idea. If it came out uh, the, uh, hot, uh, then uh, they'd get on blue. So I do have the impression every now and then they break open the, the furnace and it, no, oh, it's blue today. We ran a little hot. Um, uh, but, um, and the Egyptians also had a blue, which was made out of calcium, copper, silicon, and oxygen. This is barium, copper, silicon, and oxygen. Um, but this is an astonishing accomplishment and they lost the ability to do this uh, around uh, uh, 200 AD. Uh, they, they just, the, the know-how was with too few people. It was used to call the terracotta warriors in that uh, period of time uh, to protect the emperor in the afterlife uh, instead of sacrificing real warriors. Uh, they could make warrior, uh, uh, terracotta uh, soldiers that looked good enough. Um, and for that reason, I say that material science has been saving lives for more than 2,000 years. Um, and I point that out to the NSF as part of their mission. Um, now, materials limitations uh, carry through to the 20th century. Uh, the state-of-the-art building material in the early 20th century was cast iron. Uh, and cast iron building architecture reaches six uh, stories. And the reason is you cannot support uh, higher than uh, six seven stories with cast iron. It's just not strong enough, uh, and it's brittle. And so if you go to Manhattan, uh, you can build Soho uh, with cast iron. All the buildings in Soho are made of uh, cast iron, uh, the old ones. Uh, but it takes steel to build Midtown. Uh, the image on the left was uh, before ISM. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you just would not have the skyscraper without the invention of steel. And we're still doing research and development to improve steel at the magnet lab. Uh, it turns out that if you heat up steel to close to its melting point and you turn on a magnetic field, uh, steel is made of all of these very small crystallites. And some of them are magnetic. Uh, and so if you're heating the steel up in a big magnet, uh, you tend to grow more of the magnetic crystallites. Uh, the magnetic crystallites tend to be stronger than the ones that aren't magnetic. Uh, they also tend to be more brittle. So it's a trade-off. But um, it's an active research area. Uh, on, and who would have thought that we'd be still trying to learn more about steel? Uh, and I'll give you an example about why we still need to do that. Um, constraints on design. I'll start with the art world uh, uh, from the Renaissance. In 1463, Agostino di Duccio, this guy who you've probably never heard of, and I'll explain why, uh, received a commission to build a colossal figure for the Cathedral of Florence. That's the Cathedral of Florence. Um, he ordered a single block of Carrara marble, which is not inexpensive, about 20 feet high and very shallow. It's not clear why he made it so shallow. Uh, perhaps he thought the, the statue was going to be against a buttress so people wouldn't see it from behind. Uh, but he began by making, and this is a quote from Vasari, who's a uh, biographer of that era, uh, and in Vasari's words, making a, a giant cutting between the legs and mauling it so badly that the work was abandoned. 
Uh, it was abandoned upon the death of Donatello, very famous uh, uh, teenage nin ninja mutant turtle, uh, who also was a Renaissance uh, sculptor. I had to teach my kids in reverse order that set of facts. Um, and the reason is that it's thought that Donatello was actually supervising the work. So this huge investment had been made uh, and messed up, and it would be 38 years after the initial commission uh, that this poorly shaped and badly mauled block of marble that had been set aside perhaps by Donatello himself uh, would be turned over to a 26-year-old sculptor uh, who had recently achieved some success and maybe wanted to show up Donatello, and that sculptor had recently done this, which is, of course, the Pieta in St. Peter's uh, Basilica in Rome. Um, that was Michelangelo. <coughs> Uh, it wasn't actually this person who made that statue, it was that person who made that statue. He was 26 years old. Actually, it wasn't that person. There is no etching of Michelangelo at age 26. This is some guy named Andrea Cortese, but it's a portrait by Michelangelo, so that was as close as I could get to this talk. Um, so what can you do with a damaged piece of marble if your name happens to be Michelangelo? You can make this the statue of David. So he was presented with a block of marble that was too narrow and too tall to make a statue, out of which the competition had already gouged a huge piece. And with those limitations, he made this great work of art. And if you actually have a chance to see it in Florence, go around to the back side, because the right shoulder blade is actually concave. And there's no way that Michelangelo would have made that as an error. That probably is the back of the original rock. He probably backed the figure up as far as he could in order to fit it into the stone. And uh, I think engineers and scientists would identify with virtually every motivation uh, that Michelangelo had. Uh, something that had been attempted before by someone who was very famous and established in the field uh, and you come along and you want to change the place. In fact, a couple of the uh, younger scientists here uh, have gotten together and conspired and, and uh, I got word that um, they felt they could take over the place if they just had a few more people. And my response to them was, how many more do you need? Um, that's what you want the laboratory to be like. You want the next generation of engineers to feel like they're going to change the place, the next generation of scientists uh, to change the place, and the folks who make the place run day in, day out, uh, some of whom are running off to do errands now, um, to, to have that same kind of participation and buy-in to the mission. As another aside, just to set the record straight, uh, this man did not discover the theory of relativity. That man did. Uh, that is Einstein at age 26. There are photos of him. Um, and, and that's the same age that Michelangelo was when he did the Pieta. So for great creative acts, maybe age 26 is important. For rock stars, age 27 uh, tends to be uh, uh, bad news. Uh, <laughs> constraints on design. So design is a plan for arranging elements or materials, you could say, in such a way as to best accomplish a particular purpose. Uh, Charles Eames, uh, one of the famous designers, uh, interior designers. Uh, what we want the thing to do, if you will, is to generate world record magnetic fields. So we take advantage of the well-known fact that, uh, at least since the 1830s, well-known fact that if you've got an electrical current uh, flowing through a wire, you get a magnetic field that circulates around the wire. So uh, the, the wire that's carrying electrical signals here, or if you plug your lamp into the wall, uh, and there's electrical current flowing through it, there's also a, a weak magnetic field around it. It's too weak to, to detect. It's too weak to even deflect a compass uh, needle. But it's there, and one way to amplify it is to wrap the wire into a coil so that the magnetic fields on the inside add up. And so you, you, um, you concentrate the magnetic field. That's the reason that in school you wrap the, uh, the wire around a nail uh, before you connect it to, the, to a battery to make a magnet. And we're doing the same thing, we're just doing it on steroids. Um, we don't actually wrap the magnets around an iron core or a nail 
uh, because we need to do the experiment there. So we generate all of our magnetic fields uh, through very large currents. So to create a million times the Earth's magnetic field in a DC magnet like we do here, you have to concentrate the magnetic field inside a coil of wire. You need a lot of electrical power and uh, you need a lot of cooling water uh, to keep the magnet uh, cool. Uh, you solve the power and cooling constraints. Um, uh, 30 million watts of electrical power. Uh, the electrical current density that's going through the wire is more than twice that of the filament of a 100 watt incandescent light bulb. So these magnets, if they didn't have cooling water in them, would glow white hot uh, if they were in a vacuum. Uh, and then uh, they would melt. Uh, that heats the magnet from 50 degrees Fahrenheit to 100 degrees Fahrenheit in one one hundredth of a second, which would melt the magnet in uh, 100 milliseconds, 0.1 seconds, if there were no cooling water. And that's why we've got 4 million gallons of cooling water uh, out back. And we have to push about 2,000 gallons of cooling water through the magnet every minute. So the real constraint, those are the easy problems. The real constraint is the pressure. Um, if you uh, go underwater about 12 feet, you've got six pounds of pressure per square inch on your eardrums, and that's why you get that popping sensation. If you're in a submarine, the water's trying to crush the submarine with 1,000 pounds per square inch uh, on every square inch of the surface of that submarine. Uh, that's why they tend to be spheres or, or sausage shapes um, uh, and uh, relatively small. Um, if you want to go all the way to the ocean floor, 6,000 pounds per square inch. On a magnet, the forces are uh, like the forces you get if you step on a beer can or a Coke can for any undergraduates here in the audience. Um, they, they crush axially and they want to explode uh, on the equator of the magnet. Uh, what are the magnitudes of those pressures? Uh, for our 100 Tesla pulse magnet, 200,000 pounds per square inch. So this uh, greatly exceeds the strength of most steels. Uh, this is a piece of uh, steel that used to be part of a cylinder um, from one of the magnets that I built when I was at Bell Labs. This is a piece of the first 60 Tesla long pulse magnet. Um, the bottom was there, the top was here. That's the equatorial plane, which is where the forces are greatest. This used to be part of a cylinder and it just ripped it like a, a piece of paper uh, from those stresses. We went back and did an analysis. Metallurgists can look at this and tell you not only which way the crack was going, but how fast it was moving. So you talk about specialized knowledge. Um, we've come a long way from when hunters had to also be flint nappers, when you've got people who can look at this and tell you how fast the crack was going. Um, I asked them if they could look at train tracks and tell me which way the train had gone. Um, but there are limits to their knowledge. Um, they looked for um, places that nucleated the craft and they couldn't find any. And ultimately they did tests and they had too much of those little crystals that are magnetic that make the steel brittle. So that research I told you about about 15 minutes ago on steels is immediately relevant. Wasn't actually known that this was going to be such a big problem and we didn't do the test before building the magnet. So we built the first 60 Tesla long pulse magnet in Los Alamos essentially out of glass. Uh, glass is very strong, uh, uh, but it, uh, it's also very brittle. Uh, the one that we have out there now, we tested, uh, and um, it, um, it's working very well. Actually, it has some problems, and, and we're repairing pieces of it as we upgrade uh, the pulse, the big pulse magnet. So, Limitations on materials were like these two spiders. Um, they've got big aspirations. They've got materials properties. Um, they've got a team and a plan. I'm sure they've got some project planning in place there, Tom. Uh, if we pull this off, we'll eat like kings. So what can you do out in Los Alamos with uh, 1 million, 400 million watts? Uh, because we've... Um, uh, got that kind of power out there. You can power the city of Los Angeles. This is Hoover Dam uh, that actually has 2 billion watts, um, although the water's down now. You can go back to the future. The flux capacitor actually had 1.4 gigawatts in it. Um, 
but unfortunately we don't know how to build one of those yet. Uh, or you can pulse one single magnet uh, at the pulse field facility uh, to get twice the field that we can get here. So this is not the shortest person in the lab out there. Um, that's the generator set. It was uh, it's the largest in the country. It was originally going to be attached to a nuclear power plant that would generate steam, would turn this as a generator, and would put 1.4 billion watts on the grid. We stopped building nuclear power plants some time ago, so Los Alamos built this for a dollar, plus the cost of shipping, which was non-trivial. It's apparently the heaviest or one of the heaviest things ever moved on the interstate highway system. They had to reinforce bridges, they had to go up exit ramps and down entrance ramps uh, because they couldn't fit under bridges. Um, and uh, uh, what we do is we spin it up to um, about 1800 RPM uh, and we store energy because this thing is spinning so rapidly and it's so heavy. Uh, and then we throw uh, a switch and uh, we get 250 megajoules, which is the energy of 500 sticks of dynamite, in one second to go into the next room to make a magnetic field in an area that's maybe a half inch on a sock, a volume that's a half inch on a sock. Um, those guys are not standing there. We evacuate the entire building whenever we pulse the big generator magnets out in Los Alamos. So they get more coffee breaks out there than we do here. So. 500 sticks of dynamite equals 500 jelly donuts. Um, energy is just stored in chemical bonds, and you only have so many chemical bonds. It doesn't matter what the material is. The difference is that it takes hours to get the energy out of a jelly donut, um, and it only takes milliseconds to get the energy out of a stick of dynamite. And uh, these magnets are much more like dynamite than, than, than donuts. Uh, in fact, once you energize a DC magnet, if something goes wrong, we can detect that it goes wrong, we can shut it down to minimize the damage to the magnet. With the pulse magnets, when you hit the button that says go, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. It's like the solid rocket boosters. Uh, if it's going to work, it's going to work. If it's not, it's not. So uh, we were able to generate 100.7 Tesla non-destructively. Um, there's nothing magical about 100 Tesla except that we have 10 of these. And uh, if you know we were missing a thumb, then we'd have gone for 90. Um, but um, uh, this was the first achievement of 100 Tesla without blowing something up. Uh, the magnet uh, is roughly the size of the person. Uh, if you then uh, expand the image of the magnet, uh, the magnet's made of two parts. The outer part's here in blue, uh, and this uh, gold color and yellow color are energized by that big generator. That's what gives you this big pulse here that lasts several seconds. That inside coil is a capacitor-driven coil. And so when the outer coil gets up to a 40 Tesla, we fire the capacitor bank, energize this inner coil uh, to go racing up to 100 Tesla, and you've only got about a thousandth of a second up at peak field. And you've only got a centimeter uh, in which to do the experiment. And we did six experiments in the one pulse. Um, we also live tweeted the, the event, which was a genius idea of uh, our public affairs folks. I was old enough that I thought we should wait and do a press release once we knew if it would succeed. Um, but we apparently had 20 program managers at the NSF listening to the live tweet, and it occurred to me that in all of my trips up to Los or up to uh, the National Science Foundation, I probably have not spoken to 20 program managers in my entire career. Um, it also happened right before the meeting of the National Science Board for our last renewal proposal, and we got an increase at a time when I was being told through back channels that flat funding was pretty much all we could expect. So timing and public affairs are everything. Are they here in the audience? Um, this magnet is made out of an invented material uh, that's still being improved upon. Um, it's a wire in which you have a combination of both copper and niobium uh, that are put together in a composite uh, on the nanoscale. So on the atomic scale where uh, uh, the structure is very fine uh, grained, and I'll show you some pictures. Success required the invention of ultra-strong new materials for this magnet to work. 
It just was not possible without the invention of a new material. So nanocomposites, I'm trying to start a new age. The nanocomposites and magnets age uh, from 1988 to present. Uh, if you guys can start using this in your everyday speech, uh, maybe we can get this to stick like Bronze Age and Iron Age. Um, this wire uh, has five times the strength of steel, but it conducts electricity like copper. Uh, steel is a terrible conductor of electricity. Uh, it also bends. Steel doesn't bend very well uh, into a coil uh, in order to make the magnets. So you've been able to get three different properties that usually don't coexist by making a composite. So if you take this region and you expand it, uh, this is now a half of a millimeter, this bar. You take that region and you expand it uh, by a factor of 10. You take this and you expand it. You do it again and again. Finally, you can see that there are areas that are made of copper and areas that are made of niobium. And the niobium form very fine filaments. And these filaments are sometimes only 60 atoms thick. So it's as if you're going in there with tweezers and you're making a ribbon that's 60 atoms thick and a few hundred atoms wide and you're then stringing that through copper. And we figured out how to do that in order to get these properties. So the final uh, uh, section of the talk is the Florida bitter magnet. So I'll come back to DC magnets. DC magnets also use nanocomposites. We use copper silver instead of copper niobium at this point in time. Um, the DC magnets, um, uh, we can also start uh, Florida Bitter Age, started in 1994 to present. And the key for our DC magnets uh, was uh, discovered by uh, Francis Bitter, uh, which is, so that's the name of a guy who was up at MIT, uh, which is why they're called Bitter Magnets. It has nothing to do with mood when you make them. Um, and that's also the reason the magnet lab was at MIT. Don't use wire, use disks. Um, you get a current density, uh, so more current here, less current there, that gets, gets uh, smaller as you go out in radius. This will be one of the few plots I show. This is the stress at a particular point in the disk as you go out further on the radius. So the stress is highest in the middle and then drops off. Uh, towards the edge. And this disk ends up helping distribute the current a little bit better. Uh, but you need cooling water. And he recognized that he could run the cooling water vertically through holes. So he drilled holes in uh, the bitter plates. These big holes are for bolts to hold everything together. You can ignore those. It's these little holes that the water went through. Uh, you need more cooling near the center where you've got more current. Uh, but then your stress goes up. So the black curve is the solid disk, uh, the red curve is the bitter disk. And that was state of the art uh, for magnets uh, before uh, the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. And what uh, the folks here realized, within four years of the funding of this lab, we had a world record in one of the most visible magnet technologies, which is DC resistive magnets. It's really astonishing when you realize that that whole wing for constructing the magnets wasn't built in 1990. So they built the building, designed the magnets, built the magnets, set the world record all in four years. What they did is uh, take advantage of um, some careful thinking about what was going on and then also the ability to do some computer modeling. And rather than drill round holes, uh, make these cooling water holes into slots. So heavy, heavily elongated cooling holes uh, in a staggered grid, you notice they zigzag, and what it does is it reduces radial force transmission. I'll tell you what that means in the next slide. But it means you go from this red curve with very high stresses, which is what's going to explode your magnet, and you've dropped it down to this blue curve. So you've leveled off the stresses dramatically. So what this means in plain English is this in a magnet is stronger than that. So when you drill holes in the material, you actually make it work better, work like a stronger material in these magnets. And so this Florida Bitter design is also used uh, around the world. Um, you, uh, the, the Bitter disc is saying don't use wire, use discs. Uh, it has round cooling holes. The Florida Bitter disc optimizes the cooling slots. So what do I mean by transmission of radial forces? The, the, the force on this inner edge 
is going to be the force that's generally generated locally, but it's also going to be force that's generated at other places that are pulling out. So the idea is even here, there's a force that's going outward, and if you can connect to this inner part, you're going to add to your problem. The force that's pulling out here has a very easy path that connects you to this central point. Similarly here, so all of your forces that are pulling outward are going to add to the total sum, the big problem you've got on this inner edge. But now look, when you stagger these slots, you've basically made the thing into a spring. So you can pull here, and it's just going to, it's just going to stretch. So you're not going to add to your problem on the inner surface. And that's the reason that these bitter plates look the way they do. So um, in addition to being beautiful, uh, they are functional. Uh, and they address the uh, problems that you're faced with in designing a magnet in a very creative way. So how do you stack these to make a coil? Uh, it doesn't look like uh, it would make a, a coil of wire, but you, you stack them uh, to make a helix. So the current goes around. Uh, there's an insulator, it drops to the next layer, it comes around, there's an insulator, so the only way it can go to the next layer is in this slice, uh, continues to go around, and by interleaving the bitter disks with the insulators, you end up getting that helical current path that you need to make a high magnetic field. So that's the magic of the DC magnets. Uh, you have to stack these plates exactly right, this is the insulating material, uh, and there will be a limited uh, area where the one disc can touch the neighboring disc. Uh, they play games with the thickness of the discs, uh, with how many discs they stack in parallel. Uh, every degree of freedom you can imagine, uh, they take advantage of. So this is one disc, this is the exploded view. You then uh, mash everything together with these big bolts, uh, apply a lot of, of pressure uh, to keep the magnet so that it won't unwind under all of these forces. And then you stack them like a set of Russian dolls. So you engineer each one of these independently so that you get the best properties you can out of the magnet. I'm not sure why we chose an orange. Um, I guess it's because we're in Florida. Um, the final design, therefore, looks like this. If you slice the magnet open, uh, this is the cross section. If you look down from the top and you take the lid off, uh, it's maybe easiest to see here. Here's the nested coils. This is where the experiment goes in the center. The water comes in one port, comes out the other port. If you look from the side, you've got electrical power, 500 volts, 38,800 amps in. You get the same current coming out at zero volts because all of that power went into your coils to make the magnetic field. 2,300 gallons of water per minute in. You hope to get the same amount out of your pipe, otherwise you've got puddle on the floor, uh, and that's how those magnets work. But you've got one more materials problem. Water conducts electricity. And I've just told you we're pumping water through something that's got electrical power in it. Um, so you have to invent a new material, deionized water, uh, which is an insulator. So water itself is just H2O, and it's an insulator. But the hydrogens have a positive charge, and so they tend to attract negative ions, electrons, that they pull out of the copper pipes, they pull off the, the, the plates of the magnet, they'll pull it off of the casing, and then the positive ions, so they'll, they'll actually dissolve the magnet itself. So this poor magnet is wanting to overheat and melt, it's wanting to blow up from the forces, uh, it's running up a huge electricity bill, and we've put it in a caustic environment that's trying to dissolve it. Um, and we have to monitor the, the resistance of our deionized water, uh, because if it gets to be too conducting, it just shorts out the magnet. So that's the reason we're the center of the world for high magnetic field research. Uh, we have 1,375 users in 2014. That's where they came from all over the United States and from around the world. I like to point out that these there's another magnet lab there, and there, and there, and there, and there. There are other magnet labs here, and here, and here, and here. They're building some here, and here, and here. Uh, and yet those folks come 
uh, here when they can't do their experiments in their own labs. I'll um, take um, the 10 minutes remaining to give two examples of materials uh, studied. Uh, we study new materials, high temperature superconductors uh, were completely unknown as superconductors uh, until the copper based ones were discovered in 1987. Uh, they work in a way that uh, does not, is not able to be explained with the theory that was developed in part by Bob Schrieffer. Uh, there was a new class of iron based uh, high temperature superconductors discovered in 2008. Um, the first key ingredient to high temperature superconductivity is, uh, forget about all this complexity, these are just the different atoms, yttrium, barium, it's too complicated, that's for chemists and, and people who need to understand complicated things. For physicists, you throw out everything that's complicated until you start to understand it, and then you hope you haven't thrown out the interesting stuff. Um, the part that's interesting for physicists are the coppers with the oxygens in between. And this is a cartoon. The copper are on a square checkerboard, and there's one electron on each copper. And each electron is its own little magnet, and they like to align their magnetic fields in opposite directions. Uh, that lowers the energy. This is a vanilla state. It's called an antiferromagnet. If you have discovered it in 1905, uh, you would, well, if you have predicted it in 1905, you'd have won the Nobel Prize for theory. If you have found it before the 50s, you'd have won it in the Nobel Prize for experiment. But it's too late to be interesting now. Um, and the electrons can't move, because if this electron wants to move there, then you've got two electrons. They have the same negative charge. They repel each other. And so this is just vanilla. There's nothing interesting about this thing. The second, so, Electrons in a high temperature superconductor live in a two-dimensional universe. As far as they know, these guys know, that one doesn't exist. So your electrons in this material live in a two-dimensional universe. I'll come back to that later. The second key ingredient is now to start move, removing some electrons. So the percentage that we remove is here on this axis. This is the antiferromagnetic state. If we remove up to 5%, we get into something we still don't understand. We have fancy names for it, but I prefer messy insulating phase. Um, but between 5% and 27% of the electrons, if you remove them, you have high temperature superconductivity, and we have no idea why. We don't know why it starts at five. We don't know why it stops at 27. We've noticed that where it works the best, the, uh, the resistance of the metal changes with temperature linearly. We've noticed that for more than a dozen different materials, the same doping at around 16% uh, optimizes the superconductivity, gives you the highest transition temperature. So the nature is giving us plenty of clues, but we don't have any theory that explains any of this yet. And when I say that at higher temperatures, the resistance is linear, this is what I mean. So if you look at two materials, uh, one that has doping at 0.15, one at 0.17, we're sitting right here. And the superconductivity is very robust. It goes all the way up to 40 Kelvin. This is temperature. This is resistance. The resistance is dropping as you cool. That's what metals do. And it's a straight line. And it will go all the way up to 1,000 Kelvin. It goes all the way up to the point where the wires that you attach to the sample melt. There's never been a material in which that's been observed. And we don't have any explanation for it. So linear T resistivity is one of the mysteries. Why the transition temperature is so high at the same 16% doping is another mystery. And 16% optimizes both the superconductivity and the strange behavior of the resistivity. We don't know why. So the goal of uh, the experiments that I was doing back at Bell Labs was to build pulse magnets in, in our lab to look to see if there's a third weirdness that happens at optimum doping. Let's, let's take a magnetic field and we'll kill the superconductivity because magnetic fields are the enemy of superconductivity and see what happens. Well, what happens is the materials that have uh, fewer removed electrons
turn around and the resistance starts screaming up at low temperatures. That's what insulators do. They're, they're going to have an infinite resistance to conducting electricity. The ones that happen to be larger doping, more electrons move, stayed metals. And the transition is right between these two materials that you'd have thought they'd behave the same based on all the evidence you had before you turned on the magnetic field and killed the superconductivity. And this one, it looks like it's going to insulate. And that one looks like it's going to be a metal. So there's now a third thing that's happening at optimum doping. And is this a clue to the mechanism of high TC? Or is nature simply being cruel? And we have no idea. So the Nobel Prize has been won for discovering high temperature superconductivity. There's probably a Nobel Prize in explaining what it is. There may still be one for key experiments uh, that lead to the explanation. Maglev magnets also study old materials. This will be my last example. So we studied semiconductors, superconductors, buckyballs. Uh, but believe it or not, we also study Han purple. Um, some of the scientists out in Los Alamos started studying this material for their own reasons, which I'll explain. And then they started looking up in the literature, and they started getting all these archaeology journals about ancient Chinese terracotta warriors. And they had no idea that they were studying the, the purple uh, uh, compound that was used to, to color these soldiers. Why were they interested? Well, they were interested because it also is a quasi two-dimensional magnetic insulator with a gap spin dimer ground state. And we're pretty sure that the Chinese didn't know that at the time. Um, this material is interesting. This is the way physicists think. We're very simple people. If high temperature superconductivity comes out of a copper oxygen checkerboard, that's one layer. What's going to happen if we've got two? I mean, that's the way we think. It's, it's going to be, a, it's going to be, there are going to be differences. What will they be? Well, it turns out that you get completely different behavior. It's a very strange universe for electrons. I won't have a chance to get across all, all of the physics. But basically what happens is the electrons pair up. Uh, on each of the, the layers, and they form sort of a barbell. And they behave like a completely different particle. They behave in some ways like uh, a liquid helium particle or a light particle, uh, a particle of, of light, photon, uh, rather than electrons. Uh, in technical terms, the electrons are fermions, and these now are starting to behave like bosons, not named after the clown, named after the uh, famous Indian physicist of Bose. And without getting complicated here, when you've got these materials and you go up to 20 Tesla, you give nature a lot of options on what to do. Um, so if you give nature a lot of options on what to do, it can either make these spins line up or it can make them not line up, and it can start to behave collectively. Uh, nature's like a four-year-old. It, it will go in whatever direction you're not protecting. Um, I learned when they had forest fires out in Los Alamos, they said they were 35% contained. That meant nothing. That's just you hunkered down in front of a four-year-old, and they're just going to go some other direction. Well, nature, when it can have that much freedom to do with those little magnetic fields uh, what it wants to do, uh, it does an amazing thing which is it condenses into a new quantum mechanical state. Won't be able to describe it here, but let me just say this is a measurement of how much the temperature changes when you put a little bit of extra energy into it. And if you get some feature, if it's a smooth curve, then nothing much is happening. But when you get a feature, it means there's a phase transition. The materials change its properties dramatically. The data in 37 Tesla are in red. The calculation is in blue. And this shape, to any physicist in the audience, is the signature, it's called a lambda transition, because it looks like the Greek letter lambda, of superfluidity in helium. When helium uh, is very cold, it flows without friction. We use that feature in our superconducting magnets to help keep the superconducting magnets cold. Um, and the discovery of Bose-Einstein condensation uh, won the Nobel Prize some years ago when it was discovered in atoms. What we've done is we've discovered it in magnetic systems as well. In the material, it was used by the Han Dynasty because it had a pretty color. So 
Con uh, Bose-Einstein condensation is something that's done by photons and lasers. It's what leads to the pencil-like beam of a single color in lasers. Ultra-cold liquid helium and ultra-cold atoms. And now, in materials that look very much like high-temperature superconductors, except they have two layers rather than one. <coughs> so, conclusion one for the talk, for an electron, every material is a different universe. The reason I didn't go into high energy physics or astrophysics is you've only got one universe to study. If you're in condensed matter physics, every interesting new crystal, and you want to grow crystals because then they tend to be cleaner and, and more uniform properties, uh, every crystal is a different universe. And as two examples, if you have copper and oxygen on a single layer uh, and you remove a few of them, you have a high temperature superconductor. Somebody's going to win a Nobel Prize there. And if you have two layers, uh, you get Bose-Einstein condensation. And at least so far, I think there's not any new Nobel Prizes in that field. I think they've all been won, but it's still pretty cool that it happens. Conclusion two. All of this is made possible by the perfect marriage of arts and sciences, which has to be the Florida Bitter Disc. So thank you very much.